Hello, and welcome to the lecture for chapter 11. This lecture is about light. And I certainly feel like this lecture has been a long time coming. I've talked about light in one form or another in many previous lectures, starting with when we talked about heat flow via radiation, which was heat flow via light, all the ideas about that radiation, when we also talked about waves in general, and we've touched so many times on the idea of light. But here, we're really going to formally dive into it and spend a whole chapter on light. Now, that said, we're actually going to be limiting our discussion on light. Believe it or not, spending a whole chapter isn't enough, which probably shouldn't be a surprise. There's hundreds of books written on the topic of light, probably tens of thousands of books. Now, what we're leaving out, what we're not going to cover so much in this chapter or in this course as a whole, is light behaving as a particle. Now, I bring that up because we're going to touch on it a bit when we talk about the structures of atoms and how atoms interact, and even when we talk about astronomy and the fingerprints of certain elements from the periodic table. We'll talk a little bit about light behaving as a particle, but it's kind of something in the background. It is worth noting that kind of modern physics, such as quantum mechanics, which includes treating light as a particle, just doesn't fit into this course. So if you want to dis discuss those ideas, you should take an entire course on just physics. But with that out of the way, let's talk about light as a wave, because that's really the main topic here. But light as a wave has actually a lot of subdivisions, a lot of ideas that we can cover, such as the electromagnetic spectrum, so that's all the different types of light waves, how light is transparent through certain mediums and opaque through other, all right? So, you know, certain materials and certain types of light are transparent and opaque in different materials. Then we'll talk about the other wave-like properties of light, the fact that it can be reflected and refracted. And back in lecture 10, we saw that sound can be reflected and refracted. So this should look familiar, and you should definitely watch the chapter that introduces waves, the lecture for chapter 10, before you watch this one. Then we'll talk about color, because obviously light and color are intimately related. We, we talked briefly about how, back when we talked about our thermodynamics, how different temperature objects have different colors associated with them, and there's a direct proportionality between the color that things glow and their temperature. But there's more to color than just that, and we're going to get into some of those ideas here. Then we'll talk about the dispersion of light and one last wave-like property of light, the fact that it can be polarized. And what does that mean? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so what is light? Well, light is an electromagnetic wave created by vibrating electric charges having frequencies that fall within the range of sight. Okay, so when we talk about visible light, that's what we're talking about with the range of sight. Now, all all electromagnetic radiation, including radio waves and microwaves and x-rays, that's all light. Now, people kind of use that term differently in different, you know, kind of groups of science. But the fact is that it really is correct to say it's all light. But the range of sight, we call that visible light. Okay? So the frequency of vibrating electrons equals the frequency of the light, just like the frequency of a vibrating sound wave inside a wind instrument equals the frequency of the sound that it produces. Okay? All right. And it travels nearly a million times faster than sound and air. And that's actually kind of a neat thing about the numbers. If you remember, sound travels at about 300 meters per second, and light travels at about 300 million meters per second. So a difference of a million. So light speed, all right, and then sound speed. Now, when we say light speed and we say that this is an absolute value, that's entirely true. Now, it has functionally different values when it travels through things that are other than a vacuum. So light effectively travels slower through water or even slower through a transparent material that's very dense like diamond. But in reality, the little vacuum gaps between the atoms all have light traveling at the same speed because there's no other speed that, that light can propagate. And we talked about that when we talked about the electromagnetic induction concept in chapter nine. So please review that idea as well. Now, light and all electromagnetic waves are transverse waves, which means they're not, not longitudinal waves, and, mean, and which means that their displacement is perpendicular to the direction of motion. And we can actually see that in the next picture. We see here, light can be represented as an electromagnetic wave. We know that it is a, a mutual induction of changing magnetic and changing electric fields. Okay, That's the big idea behind light. It is made up of a vibrating electric and magnetic field that regenerate each other. That means they induce each other, all right? 
through electromagnetic induction. And so we see that there is a varying field strength of the electric field shown here as a like with a waveform perpendicular to that is a varying strength of a magnetic field showing in the blue also as a wave as a sine wave and then the both of those are in planes that are perpendicular to the actual direction right so we can see that there's three directions it's a 3d picture we could think of the blue magnetic field as in the z direction we could think of the pink reddish um, electric field as in the y direction and the actual velocity as in the x direction all right, for example. Okay, so that's all great to understand that it's electromagnetic phenomenon and that it's, it's perpendicular, which means it's a transverse wave. But I think almost what's more interesting, one of the coolest things about light is the different types of light because it's kind of fun to catalog them. And, and a picture or a figure like this one is so interesting to analyze because so we can see that light ranges drastically in frequency and wavelength, although the speed is always the same. It's always the speed of light, right? It's always the same speed, V equals the speed of light, which we usually denote by the letter C, which is to say it again, I know I'm a broken record here, but to say it again, it's 300 million meters per second, okay? All right, and actually I wrote that as 300,000 meters per second. That's a typo. Now, if it's 300,000, it should be kilometers. If it's 300 million, there should be an extra set of zeros. And I'm going to go ahead and correct that back up here and change that to kilometers, okay? Because it's 300,000 kilometers, and since it's 1,000 meters per kilometer, that gives us the 300 million. So sorry for that little typo there. I just uh, noticed I was writing 300,000 and not 300 million. If I did want to write 300 million, by the way, I would just have to add an extra set of zeros, so it would look like this. All right, so that's also the speed of light, either 300,000 kilometers per second or 300 million meters per second. All right, so again, excuse my goof. All right, so here is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Spectrum basically means like the range of types of light. And the way we catalog those is we, we think about the ones that have the lowest frequency up to those that have the highest frequency. So notice this graph varies from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency. And at low frequency means long wavelength. Okay, because if the frequency is low, the wavelength is long, and vice versa. If the frequency is high, then the wavelength is short. Okay, so the wavelength varies drastically, and the frequency does as well. In fact, this this idea of you know showing here that this is a big long wave, right? So the wavelength here going from peak to peak is rather long, and then it's shown over here as being quite a bit shorter. Well, it's actually not to scale because in reality, the range of light varies so drastically that the wavelength for very short wavelength, high frequency light is actually many, many times shorter than for long wavelength light. And we can, you can see the values here. So if we consider the lowest frequency, longest wavelength light, that's radio waves. And that's radio waves like AM, FM radio, as well as radio waves that are even longer, the type that are used for um, you know, the, um, submarine communications, for example. Those are some of the longer, longest radio waves. They can be as long as a thousand meters, a kilometer in length. That's a long light wave, right? Now, many, many radio waves are more on the order of about one meter in length. As we continue into higher frequency, shorter wavelength light, we get into the microwave range. So microwaves are a category of radio wave. We think of microwaves as being used for cooking, but they were first discovered because the military was experimenting with different types of radio waves. It just turns out that they vibrate water molecules very well, which is why they're so effective for cooking. But that's, that's the idea of microwaves. They're called micro because they're the shortest of the radio waves. But it's kind of a confusing name because they're quite a bit longer than, say, visible light. As we continue to move into higher frequencies, shorter wavelength light, we get into the infrared. Infrared is still invisible light, which means it has longer wavelengths than visible light. And as it's called infrared because it means it's past red. Now, eventually, when we get up right here to 4 times 10 to the 14 hertz, which corresponds to a wavelength of about 700 nanometers, because right? remember, every frequency corresponds to a particular wavelength, we get into visible red light, the type, of, the type of red light that you can just barely see, because any light that is longer or lower frequency than that would be invisible, it'd be infrared. And infrared is, is like heat signatures, and it's also what's used for, say, communicating between a remote control and an electric device. Then the visible spectrum is a pretty tight band of light. We can see it just takes up a tiny fraction of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. And the visible spectrum is all the colors of the rainbow with red, yellow, orange, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Right? So those are all the colors of the visible spectrum. Okay?
And as we, um, oh, and I actually swapped orange and yellow, should be R-O-Y-G-B-I-V, okay? So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, right, violet. You can remember it's Roy G. Biv, okay? And then after blue, and we continue now to get an even shorter wavelengths, so short that they become invisible, whereas before everything was invisible, that's radio waves, microwaves, and infrared were all invisible because they were too long, the waves were too long. Or you can think of the frequencies as being too low for the human eye to see them. But now we move into the higher frequencies, very short wavelengths, and these all become the types of light that are harmful, higher energy, potentially dangerous. Right, so past the blue, whereas everything, everything in the infrared and microwaves and radio waves were all harmless, low energy. So ultraviolet is beyond blue, just like infrared is beyond red. Ultraviolet is anything that has a shorter um, wavelength than violet. Okay, and then eventually, as you continue to move past ultraviolet, you get into X-rays. So eventually, a very, very short ultraviolet um, light wave becomes an X-ray. Now, notice it's called a ray, not a wave. That just has to do with the way it was discovered. Uh, scientists weren't sure what it was. It, turned, it was later found out to be a form of light. So then we have X-rays, and then finally we get into the gamma rays. Gamma rays are even shorter than X-rays, and even more potentially harmful. Okay, so that's the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And there's little subcategories in each, but this definitely encompasses all the big parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so much of science involves measuring these types of light, okay? So the electromagnetic spectrum spans waves ranging from lowest to highest frequencies. The smallest portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, spectrum is what? Radio waves, microwaves, visible light, or gamma rays? What do you think? Well, it's actually visible light, right? The visible light just takes up a tiny portion of the overall spectrum. All right, so the electromagnetic nature of light, it can be thought of this way. In terms of order of increasing frequency of visible light, we go from red to violet to ultraviolet to x-rays and gamma rays. And notice we're leaving off everything on the other side of red, things that have even lower frequency, right? If we were to in, in expand this list and include things above red, then what would we include next? Well, infrared, right? And then even with a you know shorter wavelength, lower frequency would be microwave and radio wave. So, a photographer wishes to photograph a lightning bolt by setting a camera so that it is triggered by the sound of thunder. Is this a good idea or a poor idea? What do you think? Think about the speeds here. Good idea for nearby lightning strikes, good idea for all lightning strikes, or a poor idea for nearby lightning strikes, or a poor idea for all lightning strikes. What do you think? Well, it turns out that it would always be a poor idea because even if the lightning is relatively close, the sound is, is going to take some time, even a fraction of a second to get there. And by that point, the light would have already passed the camera and you would have missed the actual lightning burst. OK, so now let's talk about transparency and opaqueness. So the ability of light to pass through some materials, but not pass through others. Now, we've actually talked about transparent and opaqueness before, way back when we talked about the greenhouse effect, because the greenhouse effect for a planet's atmosphere like Earth is so named because of the similar phenomenon that occurs for glass, trapping infrared light, but allowing visible light to pass through. So that's what this idea of, of some things being transparent and other things being opaque was first introduced. But here we're seeing it again. All right, so what are opaque materials? Well, colored glass is opaque to much of incident white light, okay? So it doesn't allow much, much light to come through, okay? So glass does not allow ultraviolet, it stops ultraviolet light, and it also stops infrared light. It only allows a small part of the visible spectrum, or most of the visible spectrum, but a small part of the overall electromagnetic spectrum to actually pass through. So we, really, we see that this is just an example of one material and that one material's particular behavior to letting certain types of light go through. And that's really true of almost any material because any material is made up of atoms. Those atoms are prone to vibrate at certain frequencies. Those frequencies have to match the frequencies of the light. So that means that any material is opaque to some types of light and, and transparent to others, okay? So light incident on dry surfaces bounce, bounces directly to your eye. Whereas with wet surfaces, it bounces inside the transparent, transparent wet region, absorbing energy with each bounce. So by the time it reaches your eye, it's darker than dry surfaces. That's why when things are wet, they look darker because of that bouncing and absorbing of energy with each bounce. And think about that. Every time you get something wet, it always looks darker. Why is that? It has to do with the absorbed energy of each successive reflection within that water. 
all right? Now, light is transmitted similar to sound. Really, a lot of the same ideas here. We can think about the source that it's spreading out in, in many directions. And light incident on matter forces some electrons in the matter to vibrate. Just like sound can force, especially if it matches the resonant frequency or natural frequency of a tuning fork, sound can force a tuning fork to vibrate, right? Well, just the same idea, or at least a very similar idea. There are some differences, but it's the similarities I think are more important to us than the differences. Light, when it when it reaches some atoms, we can think of those atoms as behaving in a cartoonish way as tiny little tuning forks, and they have particular natural frequencies that they want to vibrate at. And if the light matches those natural frequencies, then they're they're easily vibrated. And that's what transparency is all about. And again, you know, you could think of these as the atomic nucleus of, say, a material like glass, right? So as the light passes through that glass, that's what's happening. It's actually going from atom to atom, causing a vibration. And then when that atom vibrates, it then actually produces light that then vibrates the next atom down the line. And then it goes through a series of these atoms, actually transmitting through the material. All right? So then we can think about that process of penetrating a pane of glass, that transparency process at the submicroscopic scale, at the atomic scale. So let's zoom in on this a bit. Imagine light coming in. So this is a light wave coming in and hitting the first of a very thin piece of glass, so thin that it's only three atoms thick, okay? Now, now let's think about what happens. That first atom absorbs the light. Now we see, we see it here gulping up the light like a, like a little amoeba eating it. In reality, that's not what happens, but there is a transforming of energy. So the actual energy of the light becomes potential energy within the atom. But then eventually that atom releases the potential energy, turning it back into electromagnetic energy, okay? When that electromagnetic energy is then transmitted as light, it, get, it then goes on its way in a particular direction to the next atom, which absorbs it as potential energy within the atom, then eventually re-emits it when that potential energy is released. And then again, it then passes to the third and final atom in this very thin piece of glass, which absorbs it and releases it. And then you have the light coming back out the other end. It's not actually the same light wave. It's it's a totally different light wave that's that you know that has been you know created and transformed from different one different form to an energy, but it retains the exact same frequency because there was a vibrational consistency through each of these processes. Okay? So let's read the description here. We have that the electrons and atoms of glass are forced into vibration. The energy is momentarily absorbed and vibrates electrons in the glass. A vibrating electron either emits a photon, and a photon is just what's the packet of light, it's the actual particle name for light, or transfers the energy as heat. The light slows due to time delay between absorption and re-emission of photons. That's why we say that light goes slower in glass. It's not literally going slower. Each of these cases where it's moving from one atom to another, it's still moving at the speed of light, but the functional speed is decreased because the process of atoms absorbing and re-emitting, that takes time, okay? So the average speed of light through different materials in the vacuum, right, or the vacuum between any, any atoms, but or a place where there's almost no, act, no atoms, that speed is always 300 million meters per second, okay? Now, in the atmosphere, where there are atoms, and those atoms have to absorb and re-emit the light, because the you know because gases are generally transparent to many many frequencies. Not all, though. Like our own atmosphere is obviously transparent to visible light, but it is also opaque to X-rays, for example. All right. So um, in that case, it's slightly less than C, but it's so close that we can usually round it, still being 300 millimeters per second. Water, though, is significantly slower because of its high density. So water has an effective speed of light within the water of 0.75. C, at least for the frequencies that are transparent, right? All right. And then glass, it's slower still. And diamond is one of the slowest. Diamond is so slow that it travels at less, less than half the speed that it would in the vacuum. So it's traveling at just 41% of C. All right. So it's drastically slowed down. And it really is the most extreme example, but that's because diamonds are so dense. All right. So strictly speaking, the photons of light incident on glass, and again, photons is the name given to the particle of light, are also the ones that travel through and exit the other side, not the ones that travel through and exit the other side, are absorbed and transformed to thermal energy, or are they diffracted, which is to say that they're spread out? Well, I kind of hinted at this a minute ago, so if you're paying attention, you know the answer. They are not the ones that travel through and exit the other side. Right, so as we saw in the figure, you know, where we saw the atoms gulping up those photons or packets of light waves, we see that they actually it, it is a separate uh, light wave that is created on the other side. Okay, all right. 
So now let's talk about how light is reflected and refracted, which means how it's bounced and bent, okay? Well, light is reflected very much like a sound wave. So we can think of reflection as the returning of a wave to the medium through which it came when encountering a reflective surface. And the law of reflection, just like with sound, because it applies to all waves, says that the angle of incidence, that's the angle of the incoming wave, equals the angle of the outcoming wave. And notice that we, we're showing a ray here. We've shown rays before. We kind of jump back and forth a lot between talking about waves and talking about rays. The whole idea there that is the ray represents the direction of the wave velocity. All right, so it's kind of like a track of where the wave would have gone. And then if we wanted to draw the wave, we could draw it on top of the ray, like something like this, all right? Or at least, you know, this would be one, one component of the electromagnetic wave of light, because of course it has a magnetic and a, um, an electric component, okay? But we could kind of draw the wave superimposed on top of the ray, all right? So just to make, make it clear, when we talk about rays, we're also talking about waves. But here we see that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. See, it's the exact same angle, theta, in both cases. And also note that if that angle is the same relative to this direction, which is called the normal, then that means that these angles would also have to be the same, okay? So we could say here that theta one equals theta one and theta two equals theta two, and theta one plus theta two equals 90 degrees, okay? And that idea of the normal, if that's a strange term, what's normal about this? Normal is actually just a scientific term that represents perpendicular. So the normal direction is a direction that points exactly perpendicular to the surface of the planar mirror, because it's a flat mirror, okay? That's what normal means. It means straight up, up and away, straight perpendicular. Okay, so a consequence of reflection is that you can end up with images. And images, just like in a mirror, like in your bathroom or your kitchen, right? or I guess I don't know if there's mirrors in kitchens, but let's say your bathroom mirror, right? So you think of the image that's created, that's called a virtual image. What do I mean by a virtual image? That means that there's nothing actually there, right? There's When you look at a flat mirror in, in your bathroom and you see a reflection of yourself, it's not like there literally is another one of you standing behind the wall. Of course, it's just a virtual image, right? There's no actual object there. And virtual images of flat mirrors are the same size as the object, Right, the object being the actual thing that created the image, and they're formed behind the mirror. They're located at the position where the extended reflected rays converge, as far behind the mirror as the object is in, as is in front of it. So the distance from the object to the mirror, which we could say call D, is exactly equal to the distance behind the mirror to the image, which we'll call D prime with a little accent mark, okay? So those two distances have to be equal to each other. D equals D prime, all right? And that's for flat planar mirrors like we typically use, okay? And, and again, when we say that we are extending the reflected rays, that's like imagining this particular ray up here as an example and thinking about it being reflected according to the law of reflection and then taking that reflected ray and drawing this dotted line, which is the extension. And where all those extensions meet, that's where the image is formed. And you could do that for any point on the object, such as in this case, doing it for a point coming from the middle of the flame of our object being a candle. And then you could do that to kind of build out your whole image location, okay? So plane mirrors are the flat type, like shown here, all right? The only axis that re is reversed in such an image is the front back axis, right? So if you think about what's happening, the up down axis is unchanged as is the left right axis. It's only this axis, the back and forth axis that's reversed as, as an effect of reflection and the forming of that virtual image. Now that might be surprising because you think about when you read something in a mirror, it looks like it's, it's written backwards. So it certainly seems like it's the left right axis here that's reversed, but that's just the way your brain processes the information because your brain actually isn't really willing or able to reverse things on the vertical axis because we have such extreme asymmetry between say our head and our feet. But it is quite easy for us to switch things up. And so when we see the image, our brain just automatically switches those directions in order to compensate with the, the forward backward axis being flipped. So it absolutely is an effect of the human brain processing information, which is really interesting because there are lots of cases where what you see really isn't what's happening. It's just what your brain is processing, okay? Now there are other types of mirrors, however. I often think, th think of these as the fun house type of mirrors because they don't have too much practical purpose. Although, you know, certain security cameras use those curved mirrors, or you could think of a rear view uh, mirror on a car having a curved mirror so you can see things that are um, kind of, you know, like closer to you and you can see them more clearly. And those types of curved mirrors are convex and concave. 
And a convex mirror is a mirror that curves outward, as shown here, right? So here's an example of a convex mirror. And a concave mirror is a mirror that curves inwards. So here's an example of a concave mirror. To remember the names, just think a concave mirror is like a cave, it goes in, all right? And a convex mirror creates virtual images all the time that are always smaller and closer to the mirror, okay? So every time convex mirrors create virtual images that are smaller. So they're like the plane mirror in that case because they only create virtual images, but unlike the planar mirror, the flat mirror, they create an image that's smaller, that's shrunken down. On the other hand, concave mirrors are a bit more complicated. They create virtual images that are larger and further away than the object, and they also can create real images. So if we say took this, this man here, right, and we put him further away, then we can actually have a case where all the reflected rays converge on the same side as the object, is the same side as the man. In that case, it wouldn't be a virtual image, it would be what's known as a real image, because the light would actually be converging on the same side, okay? All right, so now let's talk about diffuse reflection. We talked about this when we talked about uh, waves in general. Well, here's the idea again. Light striking a rough or irregular surface reflects in many directions. This is an undesirable circumstance in the ghost image that occurs on a non-cable TV set when the TV signals bounce off buildings and other obstructions, right? Which is a bit of an outdated example, but some of you might remember that, all right? And if we think of the open mesh parabolic dish is a diffuse reflector for short wavelength light, for radio wavelengths, okay? Because it's it doesn't have to worry about waves that are going to fit through the mesh because it's, they, they're going to hit all those little cracks in the mesh, okay? And it is also a polished reflector for long wavelength radio waves, right? Because in that case, the gaps are so, are so much smaller than the radio waves that the gaps might as well not be there, okay? So different road surfaces determine the amount of diffuse reflection. Rough road surfaces mean lots of diffuse reflection, but wet, wet roads are smooth, which means there's not much diffuse reflection, which means seeing is much more difficult. All right, so when you stand two meters in front of a plane mirror, your image is where? Now remember, this was a few slides back. We talked about the rule of the distances between the image and the object for planar mirrors. So in that case, would it be two meters in back of the mirror, uh, back of the mirror, four meters from you, both A and B, or none of the above? What's the correct answer? Think about this one carefully. It's both, because two meters in back and four meters from you mean the same thing. You know, because you're here, two meters in front of the mirror, so that's the first two. The image is formed back here, equal distance from the mirror, which is another two. When you sum two plus two, you get four. So they're both the correct answer. Okay, so that's all about light bouncing off of things, but what about light bending? Because anytime the speed of light changes, and we already saw that the speed of light changes in different mediums, or at least the effective speed. For example, it was 75% as fast in, in, a, um, in water as in a vacuum, and only 41% as fast in diamond as in a vacuum. So the speed changes, and whenever the speed of a wave changes, whenever wave speed changes, so does the angle that that wave makes with the surface between whatever the light was traveling through, or the wave was traveling through, and now what it, the new thing it's traveling through. All right, so refraction is all about the bending, in this case, the bending of light waves, when the light waves pass from one medium to another. And medium just means any, any transparent substance. It could be a gas, it could be a liquid, it could be a solid, okay? And it's caused by that change of speed, okay? So if we think of glass or air, right, and light coming through air and then hitting um, grass, then we see that what's happening here is we have a person that's, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is not air and grass, this is a sidewalk and grass. So if you think of someone of walking, when they're walking on the sidewalk, they're able to walk faster than when they're walking in the grass. So if they want to take the minimum time, so min time, to get from this point, point A, to this point, point B, then they want to turn in such a way that they go through the sidewalk with, an, with a, a somewhat longer path because it's a, it's a wider angle, but then when they get to the grass, through which they move more slowly because it's harder to walk through grass, then they wanna to turn towards the normal direction. Remember, the normal just means perpendicular to the interface from sidewalk to grass. They want to do that because they want to minimize the amount of time they spend in the grass. Now, you might say, well, they're not really completely minimizing the amount of time they spend in the grass, because in that case, they would walk exactly along the normal, wouldn't they? But that's because we're not just minimizing the time in the grass. We're minimizing the overall time, the time from point A to point B. 
So it actually wouldn't be best to walk straight to the grass because that, that would be a significantly longer path to get to B because we'd have to walk all the way through the grass to get down to here and then we have to turn to get to B. So the best case is to take this particular angle, all right? And that's actually true of light. Light will always take the fastest path. It's not like light knows to take, take the fa fastest path, but that is a helpful way of thinking about this. This idea of refraction, the bending of a wave, particularly the bending of a light wave, right? So now the air and water example, since light travels faster through air, its angle that it makes with the normal direction is large. We'll call this the angle of incidence. And the angle it makes with the normal direction once it's refracted, the angle of refraction is smaller. So the angle of refraction, the angle of refraction is smaller, there's the, that list the less than symbol, than the angle of incidence because the velocity in the water is slower than the velocity in air because the velocity in the water is slower than the velocity in air. So anytime the light slows down, it bends towards the normal. Let me repeat that again because there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. So here's the rule you need to remember. Anytime light slows down, it bends towards the normal, right? So here, air to water, that's a slowing down process. So we see a bend towards the normal direction, okay? The normal direction being this dotted line, okay? So hopefully that is clear. So here we see a consequence of refraction. We see the light rays pass from air into water and from water into air. The path rays are reversible for both reflection and refraction. And that causes the effects like this, of light shining down from this flashlight in, you know, or from, from the air, coming down into the water, bending towards the normal, hitting a mirror, then coming up out of the water and bending away from the normal. Because it bends away from the normal in this case, because when it goes back into the air, it speeds up, right? And since it's speeding up, it bends away from the normal. Of course, when it slowed down, it bent towards the normal, right? So we can see both cases here, which is what we mean by the fact that it's reversible. And both cases happen, all right? So refracted light that bends towards the normal is light that has slowed down, sped up, nearly been absorbed, or diffracted. Which one is it? It is, of course, slowed down, okay? Refracted light that bends away from the normal is light that has, I bet you know it, make sure you know this one, sped up, all right? Okay, so this has some really interesting effects because it has to do with where we see images formed when we say look into water. And you probably notice this if you've ever looked into a body of water like a pond or a fish tank. The actual locations of the objects in the water are not as they seem. So for example, when you look into water at a certain angle, so here you are the observer, you see the light coming from the fish. We can think of the fish as a light source. Now you might be like, well, light, the, the fish isn't glowing. Yeah, but it is reflecting light from the sun, so effectively it's a light source as far as you, the observer, and your eye is concerned. So you can think of the light coming from the fish as it comes to the water, we then see that there's a certain angle that that light ray makes with the normal direction. We could think of that as the angle of incidence. When it enters the air, that angle of incidence is going to be increased, all right? And we should say the angle of refraction is gonna be greater than the angle of incidence. It bends away from the normal because it's speeding up as it goes from the water into the air, all right? And as it speeds up, it bends away from the normal. That creates this effect right? The bending of the light ray. But your eye doesn't know that the light ray did that. Your eye extraps extrapolates the data of multiple rays. And when it does that, and your eye says, oh, well, I know where the location is. I, I have biopic vision. I can, I can tell, you know, you, using depth perception where things are, then your, your brain and your eye and, and all the processing of the nerves within your head tell you that the fish is located right here. But again, in reality, the fish is not located where you think it is because of the refraction of light, okay? So that means that if you wanted to say spear the fish, you would want to spear slightly closer to you than the fish appears. And you'd have to, you have to remember that the fish also appears less or appears deeper than it really is. Or no, excuse me, it appears less deep than it really is. Because the image, as you can see, is at a lower depth than the true object, okay? So this is, this is a neat example of the image and the object not being the same. In this case, due not to a curved mirror, but to refraction, all right? The bending of light. Now, other consequences of refraction is this, is this illusion that's created of the sun. 
So sometimes there, we see the sun and it has an apparent position due to the refracted bending rays of the, of the, of the, the light coming from the sun bending in the atmosphere because the atmosphere certainly has a different you know, speed than the vacuum of space. It's only slightly different, but there's a lot of atmosphere. So the bending is overall you know, a dramatic effect. And so we see the actual path of light shows the sun down here, even though it appears to be here. So at sunset, when we see the sun just above the horizon, the sun isn't actually just above the horizon. It's below the horizon, but the light has been bent up, making it appear above the horizon. Now, this can also create what are known as these mirages. And that, that is due to the light bending due to different speeds, in this case, variations of the speed of light due to the different properties of the air. Because when the air is really hot or has, you know, especially like on a hot desert, it then creates that effect that very, that very hot air has a significant different speed than the cooler air. And that causes, just like, just like sound bends in variations of temperature air, so does light. And in this case, it creates a mirage, all right? So which of these would not exist if light didn't slow in transparent materials? Rainbows, mirages, magnifying glasses, or all of them? Well, turns out all of them depend on refraction. All images, you know, especially images are created by lenses because lenses are all about that idea of bending light. Mirages are all about bending light. And it turns out that rainbows are as well. All right. They all depend on that bending of light refraction. Some of them also depend on reflection, such as rainbows. But the point is they all depend on refraction. All right. So now let's talk a bit about color. We're actually going to get back to rainbows in a minute. But let's talk about color a little bit, because we know that the visible spectrum of light has all the colors of the rainbow. So how can we unpack that information about color? Well, color we see depends on the frequency of light ranging from the lowest that we can possibly see that our human eyes can see red to the highest. Okay, and that's lowest frequency to highest frequency. In between are the colors of the rainbow: Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, bl um, you know, green, blue, indigo, violet. All right, the hues in the seven colors: red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, are you know where you have variations of them, and they're grouped together. They add up to appear white. So if you add all the colors together, all the colors of a light source, you get white light. Now it's different than adding the pigments together to get black. So let's talk about that. So let's talk about res selective reflection. So most objects don't emit light, but instead they reflect light. Now there are exceptions, like a little LED, for example, is an emitter of light. The sun is an emitter of light. But most things we see that have color, they have the color because they reflected that color. So when you look at a rose, it appears red because it reflects red light. It absorbs, say, green light. Kind of interesting, isn't it? All right, so most objects, oh, I said that, a material may absorb some of the light and reflect the rest, okay? So that means the color of a transparent object depends on the color of the light it transmits. So blue glass, for example, allows blue visible light to pass through, but is opaque to the other colors of the visible part of the spectrum, all right? So that means that mixed colored lights come in three types. So three types of cone receptors in our eyes perceive color. Right, so we've evolved to have these specialized cells. Each are stimulated by only certain frequency of, frequencies of light. So we have particular cells, and those cells are called cones just because of their shape. There are ones that are, are good at recognizing low frequency light, and those are the ones that pick up red light. Then we have some that pick up green light, and we have others that pick up blue light. We don't have any that say pick up orange or yellow light, but that information can get added together. Think of it as an alphabet of three letters that then can be used to create many other combinations of light. So stimulation of all three cones equally, we see white light. So if light comes in with just as much blue, green, and red, we perceive it as white, all right? So the, the additive primary colors, red, blue, and green, matching the cones in the back of our eye, give us colors such as red and blue, giving us magenta, red and green, giving us yellow, and blue and green, giving us cyan. Those are the additive colors, all right? Adding together the colors of light. You could think of projectors, one shining pure red light, another shining pure blue light, and a third shining pure green light, all in, all in circular patterns. And the, when they overlap, we get the magenta, the yellow, the cyan, and where they all three overlap, the white, okay? So the opposite of the primary colors, opposite of green is magenta, all right? So we can see you got the green over here and we got the magenta over there, all right? We can't quite see, I'm gonna zoom in a bit, all right? So we got the green right here and we have the magenta right there, 
all right? And they're opposite. See, they're directly across from each other, across from the white where they all overlap. On the other hand, the opposite of blue is yellow, and the opposite of red is cyan, all right? So we see that there's other, the primary colors, we often talk about those, elementary school makes a big deal about the primary colors, but we see that magenta, cyan, and yellow are just as important. So the addition of any color is to its opposite color results in white. So if you were to say, add yellow with blue, you get white, right? Okay, so that's a really interesting um, side, side story about color. Let's get back to some other properties of light. So one thing that light can do is it can disperse because as it refracts, sometimes different colors refract differently. And of course, refract just means bend. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know how we talked about how materials are transparent to certain types of light? You know, for example, blue glass is transparent to blue light, but not other types. Well, also materials will bend different wavelengths of light differently. So in other words, blue light might not be slowed down as much as red light. And that means that since they're not slowed down as much and therefore they don't refract or bend as much, they end up spreading out within the material. So this is a process of separation of light into colors arranged by frequency due to different amounts of refraction, all right? So for example, if you put white light composed of all the colors of the rainbow into a glass prism, then the red light will not bend as much as the blue light. And then when the, that, therefore, when the lights come out, the red light and the blue light have been separated from each other. Whereas before they were all together and they're just making pure white light, now they're clearly making separate regions of red and blue, which we could say were put on a screen and actually see as bands, okay? So the components of the white light are dispersed in a prism, okay? And you can also use a diffraction grating to achieve the same thing. So when white light passes through a prism, green light is bent more than blue light, violet light, red light, or none of the above, right? So think, think about the case we saw before. It's more than red light. Red light always bends the least. So always the least. Of the visible colors, red light always is the least bending. So any material that has variable amounts of refraction, right? And any material has some amount of variation between colors, some more than others, but it's always red light that bends the least, okay? always least bend. And of course, by bend, I mean refraction. All right. So now rainbows. Rainbows involve both refraction and reflection, and they're a colorful example of dispersion. Okay. So rainbows zoomed in. This is the big picture, right? But when you zoom in on a rainbow, you can see what happens is the sunlight comes in at a particular angle of 40 degrees. That's why the rainbow always appears to be at the same altitude in the sky. It comes into the water droplet, and there is dispersion between the ends of the rainbow, the, the red end of the rainbow and the blue end of the rainbow. All right? Meanwhile, there's another band of sunlight that misses that first water droplet and hits another one below, down here. Well, the same thing happens in that lower water droplet. The process is that we end up with reinforcement of red light and blue light creating a rainbow. So all the, all the droplets, the millions of droplets all next to each other are all doing this. And when we look in that direction, we see the red light appears to come from one direction, blue from another direction. And since they're coming from different directions, they appear as bands to our eye. So we see that's how the rainbow is created. Okay? So here are some facts about the rainbow summarized in sentences and as bullet points. Okay? First, an observer is in a position to see only a single color from any one droplet of water, all right? We saw that here. Here from, for example, from, in this case, we're seeing the red from the upper droplet and we're seeing the, blue, the violet from the lower droplet, okay? Furthermore, your rainbow is slightly different from the rainbow seen by others because they're in a different location, all right? Your rainbow moves with you because as you move, a different droplet is gonna be the one exactly orienting the light towards your eye. And the disc within the bow, that's the rainbow, the arc of the, of the rainbow, is brighter because of the overlapping of multiple refractions reinforcing each other, which don't occur outside the disc, okay? Right? That's why you see that clear bow, but outside it's just normal light, okay? Now, there is such a thing as a secondary rainbow. If you see them, they're always fainter due to two internal reflections. So secondary rainbows require droplets behind the original two. So imagine that some of the light, because there always is, isn't reflected, but instead passes through. And if there's another droplet behind the, the upper one and another droplet behind the lower one, then some of the light will pass through and the same effect will occur. 
all right? And so that secondary rainbow occurs because of the light that was transmitted instead of reflected at the back of the spherical water droplet, all right? And that secondary rainbow, due to the fact that this reflection has occurred twice, is always reversed in color, all right? And so that means that it has red, as you can see here, on the opposite end as the original rainbow. And right, so in instead of red being on the top, red is on the inner side of the bow, the inner side of the arc. So compared with the primary rainbow, the secondary bow is dimmer, has the colors reversed, is caused by two internal reflections, or all of the above? Well, it's all of the above. All right, so let's talk about the last topic involving light waves, and that's polarization. So what's polarization? We haven't, we haven't seen this term before. Well, polarization is all about the alignment of transverse electric vectors in electromagnetic waves, which is a very technical statement. But the important thing is polarization only applies to transverse waves. Longitudinal waves can never be polarized because you have to have a displacement that's perpendicular to the direction of the wave in order to get polarization. So you can polarize a wave on a string, for example, but you cannot polarize the sound wave, okay? So it's only a property of transverse waves. So here we have an EM wave that's polarized, and here we have a rope vibrations that are polarized. What does that mean? Well, in this case, this rope is entirely in one axis. See, all the motion is entirely up and down. In this case, all the motion is entirely side to side. Those are examples of polarization. We've restricted the motion to just a single axis. Just like here, we're showing the EM wave restricted to a single plane, right? A single XY axis re represented by the yellow, all right? Same thing here, restricted to a single plane. We could think of this maybe as the XZ axis, okay? So those are examples of polarization restricted to just one plane. Right? So in both cases, the wave is in the same plane as the plane of vibration. Okay, Now that's in contrast to unpolarized light, because light from the sun, for example, is unpolarized. It has electromagnetic components, so those electric and magnetic waves, that are in all directions. So it looks something like this, if we could see it in three dimensions. It's vibrating in every single direction. If we were to look at it from the side, we would see vectors pointing in every single direction. And these could be the E vectors or the B vectors, right? the electric or the magnetic. Okay, But we can polarize it by having it shine through certain types of basically small openings made in certain materials, which are called polarizers. Have you ever heard of polarizing sunglasses or polarizing lens for a camera? That's what we're talking about here, okay? So let's think about polarized light by thinking about how we would do that, okay? So let's zoom in here and look at a flashlight that produces non-polarized or unpolarized light that vibrates in all directions. We're gonna shine it through a vertical component polarizer. So a polarizer that only lets the vertical component through. In other words, it completely eliminates the horizontal component, right? So we see that we simplify the all direction light as just having a horizontal component and a vertical component because all the directions could be simplified to, to that, right? Because all of them have you know, some amount of vertical and some amount of horizontal, which means that there is both vertical and horizontal. But the horizontal completely disappears because look, these slats don't let the horizontal through. We could think of it as a rope, right? If I'm vibrating a rope up and down in all random directions, I'm kind of swinging it wildly up and down and side to side. When it hits the fence, the side to side motion is gonna go away because it's gonna get turned to heat energy because it's gonna hit the actual sides of the fence, rub against it due to friction, and it won't be able to vibrate there anymore, okay? Because the only opening is an up and down opening. Same thing with the polarizer for light. The, the horizontal component is lost to heat energy in the polarizer, okay? Now what happens if we take a second polarizer? Well, if we take a second polarizer that's aligned with the first, it just continues to let the vertical light through. But what if we turn that second polarizer to the side, effectively making, making it a horizontal polarizer? In other words, a polarizer that only wants to let horizontal components of directional waves through. Well, since it was only the vertical one that would fit through the first polarizer, when that vertical wave hits the second polarizer, now nothing can get through, and the wave is just completely eliminated. The vertical component does not pass through the second polarizer, therefore nothing passes through. The wave's gone. And this would be the same for the fence and the rope, the rope analogy. We're, we're swinging the rope, allowing a vertical part of the rope to go through the first fence, but then the second fence with slats that are oriented differently means that it's just gonna hit up and up and down, hitting against the side of the fence, and all you're gonna get is just a effectively still rope on after the second fence. 
okay? So unpolarized light divided into two internal beams polarized at right angles to each other. That's the vertical and horizontal. That's what we mean by the two internal beams at right angles. One's, one's up, down, the vertical, the other's the side to side, the horizontal, right? So the one beam is absorbed, right, and becomes heat while the other beam is transmitted. That's what polarizers are all about, okay? There we go. So this is what polarizers look like. They're often kind of these plasticky sheets of, of manufactured material. And so we can see here we have some polarizers that are lined up, right? So maybe this is a vertical polarizer. We could assume it is, all right? doesn't matter if we assume it is a vertical or horizontal. And it's allowing light to go through. Now notice that the woman is dimmer. That's because inevitably some energy is absorbed, even in a, a, a particular polarizer. But if she takes one of the polarizers, these vertical ones, and turn, turns it on its side, well, now that first one becomes a horizontal polarizer. And notice it's turned on its side because it's a rectangle. And now we can see the long axis is not in the vertical direction, but the horizontal direction. So now when that horizontal polarizer matches up with the vertical one, which he's still holding in this direction, well, it creates a completely opaque region where no light can pass through, just like we saw in the figure before. But what's so cool is then she could introduce a third polarizer that is at an angle to both of them that is di diagonal. And even though she has one vertical and one horizontal, still, by just introducing a diagonal between the two, light is allowed to pass through yet again. All right, so it's kind of a neat trick about polarizers. And the reason this works is because the diagonal one has both horizontal and vertical components, so it doesn't eliminate either. All right, so use your knowledge of vectors and vector components to explain how the light can't pass through a pair of polaroids, that's this one here, but at right angles to each other, but will pass through light when a third polaroid is, polaroid is sandwiched between them, shown here. All right, pretty neat. So. Polarization occurs for waves that are transverse, longitudinal, or both. Do you remember? Just transverse, okay? Which is why sound can never be polarized. All right, well, there you go. We saw an interesting survey of lots of wave properties of light and finally had a whole chapter to talk about light. This is also a big stopping point for our whole section of chapters, all the way up here to chapter 11, talking about real pure physical concepts. After this, we're gonna move more into chemistry. So I hope this journey of these first 11 chapters has been very interesting, and thank you so much for following along. Bye for now.